if you do a, just a PubMed scientific search about biohacking, um, you will come across quite a number of different definitions. Um, certain treaties will be on how to make oneself like a cyborg, you know, putting in RFID chip uh, uh, so that you can use your hand to manipulate things, hack into computers, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also some sexy topic of biohacking of using genetic modification, uh, especially in, in, in a very amateurish way. But I would prefer a somewhat more general definition where biohacking is perhaps an attempt at human enhancement through tweaks, either through minor or some major modification. Okay, and, and that is something that uh, I would like to go a little deep dive into. So if you were to see on the spectrum, uh, even something as simple as meditation can be considered as a low-tech biohack to help with emotional resilience, uh, or even something called intermittent fasting. And on the other extreme, very controversial, and we'll even talk about things like stem cell therapy. In fact, just this week alone, a number of patients have asked me as part of the consult, say, you know, where are we now on stem cell treatment to cure diabetes? Where are we now in stem cell therapy to reverse aging? And I, I remember at one of the social functions, one of them say, this so-and-so 80-year-old went overseas, got some stem cell therapy, came back. He now bouncing around like a 60-year-old. Then I just laughed. I said, wow. That sounds really amazing. I said, but unfortunately, in Singapore, it is not legal. So I can't really talk too much about this sexy topic. So instead, I'll talk something maybe slightly less sensational. You know, uh, Twitter CEO says that he eats seven meals in a week. Seven meals in a week. So he only focus on dinner. And you can actually go... <laughs> deep dive into that article and he, he also spent a lot of thought even into that one dinner. It's not like Singapore, what's dinner? It could be Chak Kui Tiao, Hokkien Mee or something. No, his dinner is actually very healthy. So he doesn't eat breakfast, he doesn't eat lunch and he only eats one dinner and that one dinner is very healthy. Wow, is that how to live to 100 years old? We'll see. And one of the conceptual framework is that maybe by intermittent fasting is one way to regulate blood sugar and maintain a healthy weight. But is it really for everybody? You know, do everyone have to go down this fat? Hmm. That begs a fundamental question. What then is a normal sugar pattern? Okay, so um, on screen, is the graphs of healthy volunteers. Healthy volunteers that's not known to have prediabetes, not known to have diabetes, they put on a sensor uh, to analyze the interstitial glucose over a 24 hour period. And they eat what I hope, three normal meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I think if you look at the median dark black line, uh, you can see uh, that on average, the fasting sugar is about four, and briefly, after each meal for half an hour, one hour, it will go up to about seven, and then it will come down back to the baseline shortly after that. That forms what is a normal pattern. But you can see outliers also. That means all the way to the 95th to the uh, 5th percentile. You can see that there are people running so-called normal sugar at two to three millimoles per liter. No, that's not hypoglycemia. That's their normal set point. And there are some who may be have glucose excursion a little bit higher, maybe to the 8 or 9, and it would be still perhaps considered normal. So this is a, perhaps a normal pattern, right? So what would be an abnormal pattern? So let me just show you a very... Okay, before we talk about abnormal pattern, again, I just want to acknowledge that in the market right now, from the different vendors, there are numerous products that we have for professionals and for end users to monitor their interstitial glucose real time. Okay. Okay, so let me show you a very obviously abnormal case. This is a 55 year old gentleman who came to me with symptoms of diabetes. He lost a lot of weight, he was very thirsty, 
is clearly in trouble. So one may argue that even without doing the interstitial glucose monitoring, just by looking at the fasting glucose more than 10 and a HbA1c clearly very high, 11.2%. This is definitely a patient with diabetes mellitus. But it's still very nice to have these other parameters and to show you that across the board from 8pm, midnight, 2am, 3am, his glucose is clearly abnormal. 16, 18, 20, 22. There's a guy that needs a lot of help. Alright? And... Just to quickly encapsulate that based on some of the fundamental studies that have been done in the 1990s, at the turn of the century, we know that HbA1c, which is a long-term, a three-month marker of glucose, is a very practical uh, marker of chronic high sugar. And it tells us that the higher this glucose, it's a risk factor for complications, particularly microvascular complications. But a little twist in the tail is that HbA1c only explains 11% of the variation. That means there are many other factors that contribute to end organ dysfunction and complications. And one of them, perhaps, could be this concept of glycemia, glycemic variability. Okay, so let's look carefully at this cartoon. So there's graph A graph B and graph C. Let's assume for a moment that these three individuals have the same long-term glucose marker. The HbA1c is similar, say about 8%, for example. Arguably, patient B would have the least risk because if you see the graph day to day, it's very, very, shall we say, stable, as opposed to patient a, where there are big peaks and trough. And the most scary patient would be patient C, where there's not only intraday variations, but there's also interday variations. There are days where it looks really good, tight glucose control, and days it will widely swing. And arguably, I would say A and C patients may be at higher risk of end organ dysfunction down the road compared to patient B, all things being equal. All right. So, Coming back to this patient, the one who came in with uncontrolled diabetes, we treated him over four weeks, over six weeks, and if you look carefully uh, on the next slide, that even, if, even as his glucose gets stable and stable, of course, for him, we use insulin to stabilize him, and over time, as he got better, we win him off insulin and introduce oral agents, and we work on his lifestyle. And of course, by 2nd February, which was barely four weeks after the initial presentation, his glucose trend was already so nice and stable, which is very good. And if we look at the next slide, fast forward three months, four months, it is not surprising for us to see that, at it, that his HbA1c is good, 5%, his fasting glucose is good, and if we look at his two weeks, average glucose profile is very stable. So to me, this patient is doing really well. So in terms of glycemic variability, in terms of glucose, in terms of every parameters, in all intents and purposes, we have stabilized him. So patients, or not just patients, but maybe even GPs, primary care will ask, do we really need to use all these fanciful tools? I mean, for him, it sounds like a very uh, uh, straightforward case. Just give him enough pills, give him enough insulin, give him whatever is necessary. As long as, the, as long as the HbA1c comes down to 5%, 6%, below 7%, we should be doing a good enough job, isn't it? Okay, so that's when I'm going to show you a couple of other cases where the HbA1c may not tell you the full story. We will go to the next slide. Okay, so this gentleman in his 70s, he is a smoker. He loves his whiskey. He has diabetes. He has all the risk factors, and he's still smoking and drinking away and loving his life. Uh, one of the cardiologists has already put in a stand for him. No symptom, still smoking away. He still needs his smoke at least 26 a day. Now, in terms of his risk factors, I would say diabetes is one of the risk factors, but not the most glaring risk factor. Because, I mean, if you look at the bottom half of this, uh, of, of this slide, you'll see that over time, 
if you use a long-term marker, his HbA1c is very good. It's 6%, 6.6%, 7%. So whatever treatment I'm giving him, arguably from a HbA1c perspective, is actually quite good. But when we do this uh, uh, continuous glucose monitoring for him, ah, if you look at the graph, so on the right-hand side, if you look at the graph, you see an interesting pattern that his fasting sugar overnight can be really nice and tight. In fact, risk of having low sugar overnight. And he gets peaks. He gets peaks. And, okay, on this slide, it's hard for us to see this word called glycemic variability. But I'll move on to the next slide. You move on to the next slide. I blow it up for you to see uh, that... Sorry, I, I, I'm just going to advance the slide. Ah, fantastic. So just zoom in that one of the, the an analysis done when we do this continuous glucose monitoring, we can also look at glucose variability as a percentage. Okay, And it measures this and it's actually high. The cutoff we use is about 36% below. His is high, 43.7%. He has high glucose variability. And this, later on I will explain, could be a risk factor in itself for cardiac endpoints. So I don't want to go deep into this case, but basically, even though the HbA1c was, is considered good, 7% and below, I actually had a good chat with the patient and with the family and say that I'm going to make fine-tuned adjustment to the medicine that I'm giving him to see if I can stabilize the glucose variability, make it, make it such that he has less risk of hypoglycemia and hopefully attenuate the, the tendency to have glucose spikes uh, post meals to hopefully improve his long-term outcome. Okay, the next case will be even more interesting. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the, the next slide. Okay, uh, let's let's. I, I, I'm gonna actually the story for this patient is slightly less exciting. But I'm gonna present this case in a way that makes it a little bit more interesting. So if you have a 41-year-old Chinese woman and he comes to you and you look carefully at the fasting glucose, on one occasion in 2019, it's a 3.9. And on another occasion, it's a 4.0. And she is slim. Would any of you want to do any more tests for her to check for diabetes? The short answer would probably be no. I mean, she's slim. Her fasting sugar is 3.9, 4.0. Why would you even bother to waste her time or money to check for diabetes? Okay, the other doctor will say, maybe we should do the three-month marker, the HbA1c. Okay, let's, let's check the HbA1c. And her HbA1c is 5%. So now that we know that on two different occasions, spread two years apart, the fasting glucose is a 3.9, 4.0, and the HbA1c is 5%, would you do any other test? The short answer again is, Probably not, but of course not. If not, the story won't be that exciting. We did the oral glucose tolerance test for her and she failed it. Based on the oral glucose tolerance test, she does have diabetes. So you look at her two hour mark, she hit 12.6. People were going, wait a minute, why on earth did you even check, do subject her to oral glucose tolerance test? For those who don't know, Oral glucose tolerance test is such a painful process. The poor patient has to drink a 75 gram of yucky sugar quickly with under one minute. She will be subjected to two pokes, one at zero minute at, and two hours. In her case, we even did the one hour. Very important. The, the uh, gynecologist has been treating her for vagina candida infection. And she keeps having episodes after episodes after episodes, week after week, month after month. She keeps coming back to him with vagina, cannula infection. And he, was, he was very puzzled. He have excluded all possible causes. He said, out of, desperation, out of desperation, he says, let's check for diabetes. But her, her diabetes is very unusual. And, and so I said, okay, let's, let's, let's do a deep dive. Let's, let's do a continuous glucose monitoring. And actually, you look at her data set. At first appearance, everything is perfect. 92% of the time, she's in the, in the green. Her, her glucose variability is... Well, actually very good, under 36%. But if we do a deep dive into specific dates on occasions when she takes moss burger, uh, vegetarian rice burger, when she takes bitai mak or certain food, she gets this amazing big spike 
of her glucose relative to her baseline. And she says she can feel it. She can feel itchiness coming up in a, in a, in a vulva genital area uh, shortly after such episodes. So she's just a very unusual type of diabetes, which we can discuss uh, maybe next time. How, how did we try to manage such an interesting case? Okay, for the interest of time, I'm just going to move <laughs> on and uh, uh, just show you briefly. Okay, so these are very, very busy slides, which I will move at a, a very quicker, uh, quicker pace, that some studies show that sh short-term glucose variability is correlated with increased risk. Short-term glucose variability, meaning that like day-to-day, intraday, uh, interday, uh, glucose variations tend to be correlated with increased risk like cardiac. And then there's also long-term uh, glycemic variability. That means for patients whose HbA1c, whose uh, 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 um, uh, long-term glucose markers are fluctuating more than others, perhaps is correlated with increased risk. And there's also some interesting list of studies about how they're using different molecules to try to reduce glycemic variability in patients with type 1 diabetes, okay? particularly using some of the newer molecules uh, like the long-acting insulin, like the HGLT2 and the GLP-1 agonists, uh, particularly also in type 2 diabetes. Okay? I don't really want to go into the details, but I want to just dive into one particular study that I think is relevant to you all. Even the way we eat, the order that we eat is important. So if I were to just go to the next slide, the impact of food order on post-meal glucose excursion. Okay, short answer. When the volunteers were given the same amount of carbohydrates, protein, and vegetables, if they were to eat carbohydrates, protein, and vegetables, they have higher glucose spike compared to if they eat vegetables, protein, and carbs, even though it's the same amount of carbohydrates, same amount of vegetables, same amount of protein. So even the order that we eat does impact on the glucose excursion. Okay, so coming to the end, <laughs> just going to do some teaser. So we've talked a lot about patients with diabetes, even some interesting diabetes. Uh, uh, we, we also need to see that the use of glucose sensors is being used even in patients without diabetes. So on, on screen is a picture of the 36-year-old Kipchok, Kipchoge, I hope I, I pronounce his, his name properly, who won the recent uh, Tokyo Mar Marathon. 36-year-old is actually quite, a, uh, quite an amazing age to be able to win a marathon. And one of his, perhaps, way that he, he, he managed uh, uh, his uh, race is that he used a glucose sensor to figure out whether how should he feel his carbohydrates uh, do, before, during the race in order to enhance benefits. So one of my patients who's from Italy, he told me that his, his friends who are athletes in Italy are also very much into this. And one of the in, in the indices that they, they tend to look at also is glucose and glucose variability and glucose variation to see how they can enhance their day-to-day -day performances. Interesting. I'm not sure whether this will, will be prime time in Singapore. This, by the way, is not available in Singapore. Uh, it, it is not licensed for, for such. But I'm, I'm aware that there are people who may use it in an off label style in Singapore. So I will just end off with my last slide. Uh, perhaps my take on biohacking is perhaps to embrace a philosophy of improving oneself. And one of the terms that I would like to introduce in this talk is perhaps glycemic variability, which could be an important health index that we can capitalize on. Um, there are very, various methods to improve glycemic variability, particularly in patients with diabetes, but perhaps even in people that's not yet diabetes. And perhaps improving this glycemic variability could lead to better health outcomes. So with that, uh, I end my talk.